Thanks to my friends for clapping, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so I probably should start by saying that um, this a touch of fake news about this statement when I said when to worry about EBV and PTLD kind of implies that I might be able to answer the question, but I don't. It should put a question mark at the end of that, and maybe we can discuss it at the end. So EBV, I realise I'm preaching to the converted, so I'll try and be brief. Um, it's a ubiquitous virus. Um, yeah, I did have to Google what that meant. Um, it means it's everywhere. Um, <laughs> um, and most of us, by the time we're adults, will have developed um, IgG positivity to it. And post our initial infection, um, it remains with us for life, usually dormant, and us, those of us that are immunocompetent can keep it in its place, as it were, with no evidence of infection or replication. However, for our transplant patients, um, they have the risk of uncontrolled proliferation of the virus. It being a high viral load in itself is not the problem. The problem is when it mutates and becomes a cancer, that it becomes a threat to our patients. So we know what we want to prevent, and we know what we currently monitor, but we still don't quite know how to prevent our patients getting to this PTLD stage. The thing about having a microphone is you can all see my hand shaking. <laughs> Got this. <laughs> right. So what we know and what we know we don't know. So we know it's a risk factor. The current literature will say 1% to 10% of solid organ transplants um, suffer from PTLD, with 1% to 4% perhaps in kidney transplants. The reason we have a healthy respect for um, EBV is from a historical data whereby whilst the incidence was at 1.5% or so in the NAPRATIX data, the mortality rate from that group was up to 50%, which is obviously no laughing matter at all. These numbers have improved, but it's still a threat to our patients. So when you read the literature, the consensus is definitely that a reduction in immunosuppression is appropriate, and that sounds easy enough, but it's undefined by how much you should reduce it by, at what point, at what viral load, and then how do you manage the risk of rejection and the development of these DSAs in our patients. It's not clear, as I said, why some patients, what viral load will mutate into your PTLD. So again, it's not clear who exactly you should worry about. It's agreed that EBV naive patients remain at higher risk and that the incidence is higher in the first year post-transplant. Um, and it is agreed, obviously, that concurrent CMV viribia will increase your risk four to six-fold. There is a variation, we've already heard it this morning, both nationally and internationally, on the management of our viral loads and any additional screening that we do. What should we do? When should we do it? We even touched on it this morning, how often to ultrasound, what to ultrasound. And then, well, this is really quite an important point, I feel, how do you keep your families informed of the threat of cancer and how do you keep them calm about that because it's not, it's not an easy thing to stay calm about. So we know that it's a constant balance of creatinine, viruses, rejection, infection, anemia, neutropenia, diarrhea, don't, don't have specific antibodies. Oh, and there's a life somewhere in the middle of all this. We try and get them to have a healthy, happy life. Classification of PTLDs I'm not going to go into, but um, there's a, about four classifications with the first two likely to uh, respond to the reduction in your immunosuppression and the third and fourth needing more aggressive management um, with the monomorphic PTLD likely to require something like rituximab and then the class classic Hodgkin's lymphoma will have to be patient specific um, but will likely need chemotherapy. You may also need surgery, there are T-cell therapies now and of course like everything there's new treatments developing all the time. So our recent experience, we had one a month for three months in a row where we had three patients develop PTLD. Two of them were, were within their first year of transplant um, and one was at 16 months post-transplant. We have routine screening guidelines. Uh, in summary, we screen for it a lot, um, but it does depend on the virus and the patient's clinical condition. Our assay is particularly sensitive and we measure it in whole blood. Obviously, any patient who's got protracted fever of unknown origin, diarrhea, hepatitis, tonsillar enlargement, lymphadenopathy, or I gave myself lots of big words to say. 
they're still going. Um, um, pancytopenia and non-neurological symptoms um, obviously need to be thoroughly investigated. There are about one third of PTLD cases, however, that will not be necessarily EBV driven. So any patients with any of these weird symptoms definitely need close monitoring. So the first patient is a four year old boy who had valves. He had had PD for 17 months. Um, and then in November 2018, when he was three, he got his dad's kidney, 110 mismatch, twist protocol. Dad was um, CMV positive, so he had Valgan for three months as prophylaxis, and the patient was EBV negative pre-transplant. Um, as planned, he, on day 21, went down to 600 milligrams per meter squared of his MMF, sent home at day 25, nothing hugely exciting, everything was pretty standard, um, and he was stable in clinic, a bit of a limp for a couple of weeks, but nothing else out of the ordinary that we noticed. So he was following the routine frequency of clinics, um, and then just looking at his EBV trend over the first six months, um, we all talk about EBV in different numbers. Um, copies per mil is current, sort of what we had been talking about in it for a long time. We're trying to talk about it now in international units, but I've put it up as both, um, just for reference. So 20,000 to 85,000 copies he had, not huge by comparison to some, and the tacrolimus is between five and 10 for the first six months. So again, no major surprises in that. His U and E, I'm just putting it up there because it's lovely. Um, his creatinine was 30s to 40s, um, and he was really doing quite well. FBC as well, no major surprises in this. Um, nothing untoward except just in February time, you have to read it from that way up. But in February time, um, he started to drop his neutrophils a bit. But at this point, he was due to stop his Valgan cyclovir anyway, so we did. We checked an MMF level, it was one. Um, so we left him on his dose of 600 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, we did stop his cotrimoxazole a bit early just to try and help him with his neutropenia. He had two admissions for low-grade temperatures to his local, but he wasn't particularly unwell with them. And so we just kept, he kept going because he was, again, as I said, stable. His neutrophils remained slightly low, but above one. And he was on about three weekly reviews to monthly reviews. And he was DSA negative throughout this whole time. And then on the 31st of July, his mum sent me an email. He is nine months post-transplant at this stage. And she said, um, just so you know, we've been admitted to our local. He's got a bit of an ulcer in his mouth. And we said, okay. And she said, here's the photo. And then <clears throat> that jumped up at my screen. <laughs> and um, about six hours later, he was transferred over to our unit with ENT and oncology sort of already alerted to say we were probably gonna need help. So there was, again, nothing huge in the history. They'd noticed he'd smelly breath for about a week, maybe some low-grade temperatures, but again, very non-specific. He had a CT and an MRI and a biopsy of the lesion. The lesion proved that, uh, um, sorry, was diagnostic of his PTLD with a polymorphic subtype. He had CT, PET scan, um, and bone marrow aspirate, all of which were thankfully negative, but the plan was to give him weekly rituximab for four weeks, stop his MMF and continue him on low level um, uh, tacrolimus. So he had his fourth dose on the 10th of September. He had a follow up um, CT of his neck and thorax and he had a small left upper cervical node still there but it was smaller than the previous study. And when you look in his mouth, I don't have a follow up photo of his mouth but there, the lesion is virtually gone with just maybe a tiny little white spot there. Um, so the plan is for him, it's early days, <coughs> Excuse me. He's to continue on monotherapy and obviously very close monitoring. Um, this is just for reference in case any of you ask me <laughs> any hard questions afterwards. Um, but his EBV count, um, he present the photo came to us in July. So just before that, from June, again the number isn't particularly high. On the 13th of August, he peaked at 218,000 copies. Um, that was after his diagnosis, and it did clear, made a little reappearance in October after his treatment, but he had another viral infection at the time, and it is subsequently negative. And his EBV, or sorry, tacrolimus count, as I said, or level was running low. His LDH, we hadn't been routinely checking because the number of EBV wasn't particularly high and he wasn't at all unwell. So there isn't many pre his diagnosis. And then the few that we've checked since, he's borderline with a slightly high um, LDH. 
Second case, um, I need water. Grania, I'd go for the mic on your shirt because this is a nightmare. Um, <laughs> Case two was a three-year-old boy with a history of valves as well. He was on dialysis pretty much from birth. Um, and he had his dad's, trans dad's transplant, his dad's kidney, um, when he was two. One, one, one mismatch. Again, twist protocol. Um, this donor was D uh, CMV negative. Patient was uh, IG EBV, IgG neg pre-transplant. He's another boy who, again, we got down to just 600 milligrams per meter squared per day of MMF. He had a pre-transplant history of loose stools and vomiting, and post-transplant, needless to say, he had a severe viral gastritis over many months. Um, this is just for the nerds amongst us, just to see, this is his um, viral load in his stools from sapovirus here with a concurrent adenovirus for quite a number of months. And then he flips over in February, um, he developed quite a profuse norovirus um, infection. He dropped his album into 20 and within about a week or so he dropped his album further to 10 and his plan, our plan was to stop the MMF and get him on um, azathioprine and prednisolone every other day. He presented really unwell again within that same week and he was admitted for over a month. We kept him nil by mouth, he pretty much had gut failure. He was on TPN and then diet was introduced and he did make a full recovery thankfully and he was discharged on tacrolimus and azathioprine. He was also DSA negative throughout this whole course. Um, and then in the background, from January to August of that year, he had about five or six episodes of tonsillitis where he just went to his local, he was starting on um, oral antibiotics. Nothing too exciting, so to speak. Um, and then on the 2nd of August, <coughs> his mum emailed me, you've seen a trend. Um, with a video this time, um, and he was now one year post-transplant. I don't have the video, but it does show a significant um, obstructive sleep apnea. Two minutes to go, excellent. It's all right, Yelena ruined the other one anyway, so uh, she's already given you that story. Uh, we did an ENT referral, he had a tonsillectomy, his tonsils pro were proven to be PTLD positive, so to speak. We stopped his azathioprine, he had all the scans, the scans were negative and um, he had a treatment course of four doses of rituximab. I didn't get to write this in, but his EBV count is now about only one million. Um, and before that, his EBV had been running initially one to five million copies and then did peak up as far as 10 million. His LDH we were checking because his numbers were higher, but again, it was normal throughout. His uni and FBC, again, is just there for reference. Nothing really hugely surprising in any of them. Our third case <laughs> is the boy uh, referred to by Yelena who had, um, I don't know how to summarize this boy, but basically he had chronically high EB, uh, EBV um, for his first year and his counts went from sort of five to seven million in that time, but he dropped his albumin throughout the whole time and that's why we were worried about him. So we'd originally stopped his azathioprine, um, but the ongoing low albumin made us do an endoscopy and that initial result was sort of not very definitive. We sent it for a second opinion and they concluded that it likely was um, a PTLD. So the plan was to give four doses of rituximab, which we did do, and stop his um, prednisolone. Um, this again, his fourth dose is literally only about a month, six weeks ago. So his EBV um, where prior to that was in the 15, 16, 18 million, somewhere in there, um, has come down, but hasn't quite cleared just yet, but it's early days. So the discussion is, the clinical examination of patients remains really essential in surveilling for PTLD. Balancing the side effects of medications is really challenging. And again, in the context of how do you minimize then the risk of rejection, when you do reduce your immunosuppression, I think it is very difficult to keep families informed. Um, and we obviously need to maintain some data on our patient cohort. Any suggestions? <laughs> we open the discussion for questions. Do we have questions? I can't talk any faster. Thank you for these interesting cases. I have two questions. The first is you, you start quite
quite early with rituximab. It is what my feeling. That's true. Eh? Early with rituximab. Yeah. Well, it was. It was or simultaneously with reducing the immunosuppressive. So it was on diagnosis of the mm. PTLD. The plan was to proceed with rituximab with advice from our oncology colleagues. And my other question is that. I don't know, but sometimes I think maybe steroids have just a protective effect and that we have more... I didn't have PTLD for a long time mm. and that it, it starts with the twist schedule. So I wonder if this has an effect on, on our PTLD incidence. Or don't. the com combination of tacrolimus and MMF, perhaps. I'm not sure... I don't have any evidence for this, but I'm not sure every child needs exactly the same dose as MMF as you know, they don't all need the same dose, I think, to keep them safe. That's a, a very interesting point you make about the TWIST study. We also saw a rapid increase in the number of cases of PTLD once we switched over to the TWIST study. And we did wonder whether it was a problem with the assay of our tacrolimus and whether we were actually functionally over immunosuppressing the patients. Um, I'm sure you're going to get lots of comments about this talk because there isn't a clear way to manage these patients. Yeah. I think once you have a tissue diagnosis of PTLD established and you have a histological classification, then there's fairly much, as with most oncology, there's a, a recipe that you follow. Mm. With regards to trying to ascertain when you should reduce your immunosuppression, like you, we have patients all over the place yeah. and the difficulty that we have is there doesn't seem to be a correlation uh, or, or I should say there's a quite a lot of inter-lab inter variability in the assessment of EBV levels mm. yeah. um, to the point where we have actually started to take blood specimens from our patients in peripheral clinics and bring them back to be centrally analysed so that we can at least have consistency. Mm. I have to say uh, this is all sorry. from our own lab. <laughs> but it, yeah, again, it is just very tricky. As We do have a very sensitive assay, but again... Um, my, other, my other observation is that in the 20 years that I've been a consultant, I think I have treated maybe half a dozen children with uh, chronic or low-grade rejection and have probably treated three times that amount with uh, EBV-driven PTLD. So that would suggest that our balance of immunosuppression has somewhat shifted. So just to answer the comment on the MMF and the twist, so we have actually looked into that. So we have done our mortality and morbidity review following these three cases, which all presented within about a couple of months. So when we look into the data and compare to the, we've just started using TAC um, MMF and twist uh, for all our standard transplants, January coming up to two years. Um, looking at the incidence, actually we are within what's reported in the literature between one and three percent. So um, we haven't seen the difference. It's just that we've not had a patient with PTLD for so many years. Now three of them came at the same time. But looking back, it's pretty much the same. So none of these were actually documented within the, or published within the TWIST literature. Thanks. So just to follow up, because that was a big point when the, we did the first publication was just with the six month data because the sponsor only gave the drug uh, for six months and the primary endpoint was growth. But when we reviewed it and we had the investigator meeting, I said, you've got a signal of four um, cases in the decluzumab arm that had, because it was decluzumab in the original twist, not basiliximab, that had malignancy or EBV-driven PTLD. And uh, I was voted down and putting it in, but it is in the two-year follow-up. But of course, it never reaches statistical significance. So I kept on changing the manuscript to try and put it more predominantly that it potentially could be an increased signal, but um, as you said, it's very difficult to 100% and everybody says, well, it depends what your trough tacrolimus level is and how much your burden of immunosuppression is. Um, which is why when we started using TWIST, I would give it to the small infants that were EBV naive, that were getting five, six antigen matched living donor kidneys from their parents. Um, but who knows when we need more data. So as a, it's a, a simple surgeon question, but I'm, would, 
wonder what people's thoughts are on EBV mismatches with EBV naive recipients. I mean, both of your cases were EBV positive to negative, and this one is as well. And is that something that we need to give more thought to? Or how much thought do people give with that mismatch uh, and other ways to optimize that with, with children more than adults? There's been one case in the UK which was not our centre, which almost became a legal case because the family said that they weren't counselled and PTLD was never mentioned in the pre-transplant information. So it's part of our information sheets and all the families are told about PTLD and malignancies. Uh, so it's quite a difficult pre-transplant discussion. Our nurses might want to comment. They come and see the surgeons or Yelena and I and then, you know, transplant is the holy grail, but you might die or you, know, you might have cancer. It's quite a lot to take on board. Thank you but, so much. But I think it's so it's not a contraindication, but I, uh, because in fact, very often when we see them, we don't, we don't know the EBV status of the parent, but I say that it is likely that you're going to be EBV positive because 90% of um, adults are and that your child's EBV negative. Thank you so much. Great discussion.